I mean, it's not often I consider 5 volt products a fire hazard, but here yeah. we are. Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of an open source and the open source in the open source, around the open source, maybe through the open source, I don't know. <laughs> It's yes. about Linux and things we find interesting. How dare we? I'm Vince Stone. That was Joe Bryan. Everybody watching this live? Hello, hello. How's it going? Middle of the week. Plenty to talk about. Jill has a small dissertation about a keyboard. <laughs> yes. That she'd picked up from uh, AliExpress. <laughs> Actually, this one came from Timu. But Timu is like AliExpress. It's a, kind of the U.S. distribution version of it. <laughs> Look at how bright that is. So this is my new transparent unicorn vomit <laughs> mechanical keyboard I got from Timu for $23.99 from a company known as HXSJ. Yeah, Vin, and it's so generic that it doesn't even mention what kind of mechanical switches it uses. But they actually feel like uh, whites or browns. That's what it says and... in the box. It says mechanical comma probably. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And th this will be good for podcasting. I'm, I'm going to use it in here because I love this keyboard so much. It's one of the brightest and prettiest RGB Rainbow Vomit keyboards I've ever bought actually at that price. And I've been really impressed by it. I was telling Ven before we started the show that it's it's got a nice layout on the keys and the right size buttons in the right place. And they fit my hands really nicely. And uh, usually keyboards at this price point all have issues and this one seems to be right on <laughs> and i got it from timu which is really nice so i only had to wait less than a week instead of a month or more from aliexpress so and i did see it also on aliexpress and i had to double check is this one i bought before no i hadn't bought this one before <laughs> so <laughs> i got it on timu and it was actually free because i bought so much stuff on timu it was my free gift I could pick from a, a bunch of uh, items. And so this was my free gift. <laughs> How do you change the modes in it? Because it's not like something you, uh, it doesn't have any type of software control though, does it? No, it's nice because it's all uh, keyboard commands. And um, of course now it doesn't, oh, here we go. There we go, <laughs> different modes. <laughs> So for our audio listeners, what you're witnessing is a kaleidoscope of nightmare. <laughs> yeah, I knew, I knew that this is, would not make Ven happy. But look, Ven, even the back. See, it's really cool because I, I love these new transparent keyboards. And this is the back of it. Hmm. So pre pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, it's not often I consider 5-volt products a fire hazard, but here yeah. we are. Here we are, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it has an option to turn RGB off. But yeah, uh, one of the reasons I buy I, I a lot of the cheap get a lot of the cheap keyboards is because they don't have uh, software that's computer controlled, and most of them work on Linux just fine because <laughs> they're they're hardware based. Oh, did you break your other one? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I still have my pretty pink keyboard here. It's just well, you know, I switch them out every month or so. I switch keyboards. <laughs> it's just my thing. <laughs> I'm glad you're happy with it. Yeah. Now, uh, let's see. What do I got going on? Oh, man. Uh, I got this. I talked about it on Saturday. A little crinkly paper. ASMR. Oh, yes. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an AJA Kona LHI. Yeah, usually a very expensive capture card. <laughs> They're about $1,800 if you want to buy one new. Yeah. So what do you get on this? Mm -hmm. HDMI in, HDMI out, SDI in, SDI out. You get a dongle which can connect to a breakout box, or you know, it's got like one of the you know dongle breakout cables, whatever you. The, it's insane looking uh, breakout cable. So when did I get this? Uh, last year, mm. AJA came to the OBS project and they said, "Hey, we would like to work with OBS." So our Capture cards work with open broadcast. I'm like, oh, that's really neat. These being expensive as they are, I've had to sit and wait, being patient on eBay, going, somebody's going to get rid of one of these one day. And they finally did. So I want to find out 
you know, what's it like in the drivers installed in one of these? Because, hey, it's fun to play around with hardware that we normally wouldn't get a hold of. Uh, and uh, what does it take to get it working in OBS? Stay tuned for that. And of course, I'm going to nice. do an AB comparison between this and something you're probably going to be a lot more familiar with is like the Intensity Pro, which is the black magic card that does HDMI and HDMI. And it also has the analog uh, breakout cable as well. So we're going to kind of AB comparison. It should be interesting. And it's going to take a little while to get done because we don't rush through videos. No, I don't. I make sure they're accurate. <laughs> hmm. Yes, you do, Ben. <laughs> that seems to be very difficult these days for some people. So strange. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the good news, everyone. Is it good news? I don't know. It yes. signifies that this distribution is older than some people watching the show. <laughs> Absolutely, Ben. So Debian, one of our favorite foundational OSs under Linux, turns 30 years old today. Literally today, August 16th, 2023, on this Wednesday. And Debian Day parties are actually taking place in Belgium, Bolivia, Brazil, the Czech Republic, Portugal, Germany, Turkey, South Africa, and many other countries around the world. And Debian Day is actually celebrated each year on August 16th, but this one is special because it's Debian's 30th birthday today. So this is just so amazing. Uh, Debian you know, was founded by Ian Murdoch, who first announced it on August 16th, 1993, and he initially, initially called the system the Debian Linux release. And although the first release came out on actually on September 15th, 1993. And yeah, then, so I started using Debian in October of 1993 and had been using Slackware Linux when it came out that same year in earlier in July. And I've been using Debian installed on literally hundreds of machines, both new, old, and vintage in my computer collection because it supports almost every architecture of computer I own, including for my deck alpha and uh, my son spark machines so so it is just it's it is the swiss army knife of linux distros definitely and um i was i was using debian with the window maker desktop when i first started doing lww over five years ago <laughs> so it's a very important distro for me <laughs> Couple of things with that. I mean, we're we're seeing like the old timers. Uh, speaking of Slackware, because last month yeah. we talked about Slackware turning thirty as well. Woo that happened. <laughs> like, wow! And yeah. here it is. You know, a month later. Yep, Debian's an old timer too. Yeah, Debian's definitely an old timer. And I run Debian day in, day out. I don't play with it. I don't experiment with it. It's <laughs> what's on everything in the studio? It's a total of five machines. Why? Yeah. Debian does what Debian does best, stays out of your way, and it lets you get work done. It's that type of distribution. If you're ever in a situation where you need, you're going to prize stability and maybe not ease of use, but ease of customizing it is real easy. It doesn't try to, at any stage during installation, post install, pretend that it knows better. It says, oh, that's what you want to do? Go ahead. Yeah. Have fun with it. So. Like, this is one of the things I ran into for installing, um, doing some just testing with this capture card. Because as with a lot of pro video stuff, they're like, we're only going to work with this one particular kernel. Or later. And guess what? This thing only works with kernel 515. Debian 12 ships with 6.1. So it was step one. And that's already in the script for this. I'm like, Okay, so step one, if you're running Debian 12, what do you do? You need to go over to kernel.org, and you're going to have to build 515. But don't worry, you're on Debian. You know how to do this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, things that would make an art user blush. Pile a kernel. <gasps> what? <gasps> oh, for shame. <laughs> That's not going to generate any comments. Uh, so, yeah, really happy to see Debian still around, and it's sticking true to how it started. It's never sold out. It never went yeah. commercial. You know, it is still a volunteer group organization. What sold me on Debian when I was looking, because I was running Ubuntu. When I first set everything up, why did I start using Ubuntu? Because at the time, how long have we been doing this? 
this new tech had come out called UEFI. Mm-hmm. And I bought one of these new motherboards that didn't have a BIOS so much. And nothing would install on it. But Ubuntu did. So we, that's why I ended up uh, running Ubuntu. I had never run yeah. Ubuntu at the time. And gradually Ubuntu got to the point where I genuinely didn't like having to de Ubuntu the system after doing an install because everyone mm-hmm. who's run Ubuntu knows what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And it's only gotten worse over the years. So what did I do? I said, let's just go to the source, right? Because what is Ubuntu? What is POP? What is Mint? It's, it's Debian with a spoiler and a fart box muffler. Yes. It. <laughs> yes. You know, that's why I call it Debian with a body kit, you know, and yeah. everything else. Just go back to that source and it served me extremely well. Yes. And most importantly, you know, it kind of keeps you on your toes because you get that solid, stable, you get Debian installed. What do you get? After it's gone stable, security updates. And you're going to get those two to four years, depending if you're using the, um, you know, their LTS support type thing, which you don't pay for. You can just opt into it. However, it's not the old stodgy distribution if you want to run Debian testing. Yeah. Debian testing. <laughs> it's awesome. Rolling release. It's up there. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Like point to point with your package variables. Now, if you want to get that Arch experience, go to Debian Unstable. You can live, you can live that Arch lifestyle. Yes. In that ecosystem. <laughs> That's great. You know, you never know. You install something and m- maybe the system's going to come up, but you know what? It'll keep you on your toes. I don't need that excitement in my life anymore. Yeah. You want stability. Need stability. Done. I got to be able to cut yeah. everything on. You know, mm-hmm. I don't, Ever want to have to worry? I, I need security updates. You want those, but you don't want package updates. Mm-hmm. Like you mm-hmm. build a system around your current package set, and it stays good. You don't want something, uh, you know, a library FFmpeg update or something. For what reason? Oh, look, that's now incompatible with that. Hmm. But you do have to keep that in mind. You know, you got to be comfortable. Like, if I want to install updated software. We've had this discussion a couple of times in our Discord uh, this week with people saying, what about installing, you know, NVIDIA drivers with a run file versus the package manager? Like, that's just a given with Debian, even with Debian yeah, 12, it's a recent run file. Yeah. driver. I need to do a video on that to explain, because you don't need just need that. You also need CUDA. So then you got to go, how do you download CUDA? How do you get that set up? How do you get it installed? But you can also just install, like, if you don't need the latest and greatest, and this is where the equation comes in, because sometimes it's better to run, because DaVinci Resolve runs better with an older driver that has been tested against with an older version of CUDA than it does with the latest driver and the latest version of CUDA. Mm-hmm. These are A-B testing, and Debian gives you that flexibility. It's not going to fight you. It's like, yeah, if that's what you want to do, go do it. So happy to see it, and we don't ever have to worry about you know, Debian ever getting taken over by anybody. We're, we're not going to be doing a story next year. If it's like Oracle has bought Debian, there's nothing to buy. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> that makes me happy. Um, incredible work, incredibly stable distribution. Part of that is the team that will fight you tooth and nail to get your package accepted into mm. Debian <laughs> early on. That really sold me. I was watching um, on a mailing list. Somebody genuinely upset and cross that they would make a couple of, you know, relatively small exceptions to get his package into Debian. He's like, why can't you just bend the rules a little bit? I'm like, these are my people right here. These yeah. are like, no, you <laughs> do it this way for a reason. And uh, having that as part of that skeleton that Debian's built on, you know, it's got a strong base. Yeah. The community is wonderful. I always really enjoy talking to all the folks over it the Debian booth at the Southern California Linux Expo. And last year, uh, Mad Dog Hall was at the booth representing. So that was awesome. <laughs> it's good. Give it a look. And you'll notice like most of the guides and stuff I build are for Debian because there's so many different branches, you know, that usually are going to be compatible with your Mints, your Ubuntu's, your uh, Pop OS, you know, yeah. things that are built on. Top Deb it. is just universal. <laughs> it's just 
yeah, you can always count on a dot deb. <laughs> what about Windowmaker? <laughs> yeah, so and speaking of running Windowmaker, my favorite free and open source window manager for the X window system that I am using right now has a new release, Windowmaker 0.96.0. And it's actually been over three years since the last re release, and they there are some really cool new features for this next step inspired X window manager. Window Maker now supports hot corners. I was really excited about this, so you can send your mouse to a corner of your display and have it execute a command, and in you can access it in the Window Prefs app or um, edit the uh, Window Prefs file under window maker and for me this is cool because i often use window maker when i'm i'm podcasting and in fact i'm on it right now and it's it's kind of a nice nice to be able to have the hot corners because i can launch applications easily that way so instead of normally i have a little script that runs and starts up all my applications but this is just another way you can launch applications easily using hot, hot corners. And this is something I've been waiting for. And for taking screenshots, there are new keyboard shortcuts you can configure in the WPREFS app, including the keyboard shortcut, which is in the keyboard shortcut preferences tab, including a to capture a portion of the screen, capture a window, or capture the entire screen. Yeah, I know Th this for <laughs> for other desktop managers. This has been around for years and years, but we finally have it on Window Maker because I take I'm very happy about this because I take lots of screenshots. And there's also lots of improvements for full screen applications running on multi monitor or with Zynorama, which is always a good thing. And there's actually a new option added for keeping the dock on the primary display head which is really nice because sometimes uh, that's, that's, that's an issue. It'll uh, jump around to different display, but display heads when you reboot. <laughs> that has happened to me. And yeah, I just, I love and love window maker. Um, I grew up on in, in college on a next machine and I've also, I've always loved next step and I like open step and now we have GNU Step, which Window Maker is a part of. And I enjoy installing dock apps in Window Maker for viewing hardware stats, sound, using sound mixers, or just having cool little clocks. And um, actually, that was the original inspiration for the modern desktop widgets. So it, it had brought lots of progress <laughs> to the desktop ecosystem. <laughs> And it's one of the reasons I just like, I like the old school look and feel of it. I like right clicking on the screen to get my menu. <laughs> I just, I love living the old Unix life. <laughs> and I just want to thank Beastwick for posting this news in Discord chat. I knew it was coming soon, but I didn't, didn't, hadn't checked that day he had posted it. So thank you, Beastie, for letting us know. Hipsters. Yes. <laughs> Jill gets Aww. home from riding her fixie around, drinking a PBR, smoking some American spirits, and is like, man, I gotta run my window maker. Yeah. <laughs> when did I first run into window maker? Probably <laughs> my first experience with it would have been Get Off My Lawn, 1995, because I think After Step came yeah. with uh, Red Hat. And I'd run into it, and I'm like, that's ah, kind of neat. Uh, let me get KE mm -hmm. installed. Yeah. It's not bad. I don't, I don't have any... I, I'm completely neutral on it because one of the beautiful things about Linux is you can use anything you want. And I'm a huge fan of um, scaring people away from your desktop. Mm -hmm. I am. You know, if somebody gets to, a, to your computer... You know, it's been a long time since I've had, like, housemates, right? But back in the day, that was always a valid strategy to make sure nobody messed with your box, man, is to have the most random stuff installed. Window maker, yeah. good defense. They it open is. your screensaver and they're like, I don't know how to do anything. What yes. is this? Do I, where do I even click? You know, I like how minimal it is. And for, for years, I've just been going, I go in the configuration files and, and create my own configurations. And in fact, I have that file saved. So whenever I 
load up a new version of window maker i copy <laughs> all, all those preferences over so it's just it's very scalable you know because it, it, again it's it's it, it requires that you you want to learn how to use a desktop <laughs> No, it doesn't respect the user's time in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but once you get it set up, you're fine. You're good to go. <laughs> the days Aww. of having to set up a configuration file. I mean, like I said, if, if you, it, it's the, I need something to do type of desktop. I'm like, I need something to fill my time. You know what? Writing config files. Oh, it's well, something that do... will fill your time. Yeah, it, it, it does. But one of the things is I did it years ago and I'm just using that same config file and poking in the same yeah, but settings. But you still have to use Window Maker. Yeah. <laughs> See, this would be different. It would, it would hit harder, Jill, if you're like, and this is all I use, but it's not. Not. Yeah, I use uh, all the different desktop like, environments. I like playing around and you got to keep that joy. You enjoy it. I yeah. I stick with the thing that I'm like, okay, this works. All right. Does it, does it crash? I know. Nope. Yeah. Does it does it get on my nerves? Like, nope. All right, we're using this. Yeah, I'm a little odd in that. I just kind of use. You're what a tinkerer. Like. That's not. Yeah. yeah, that's. It's good about being like that, and that's how the majority yeah. of Linux users, like when they're still getting into Linux and playing around, you know, the whole distro hopping mentality, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I I am a a desktop uh, hopper for sure. <laughs> and, I don't really have to. Hop distros because I have so many computers that I, I can have every distro represented on a different computer. <laughs> and like these days, you don't even need the computers for it. You just pull them up in VMs. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. Like you can have your laptop with every distribution. Every like, distro you want. Awesome. And that's yeah. awesome. Nobody's saying anything negative about that to anybody listening in the audience. Keep that <laughs> spirit. Yeah. But when you do ask me, when will I? Because it's weird. Like, mm -hmm. well, when, when am I going to stop being a distro hopper, Finn? Like, oh, sit down a minute. You're not going to like this. You're not going to like this. It's mm -hmm. like when Linux is no longer your hobby and it becomes your operating system. Your operating system. Yeah. Wait, because what the idea of scorching your desktop and your work environment yeah. <laughs> doesn't play. But as long as it's your fun box and that's what you like doing, that's awesome too. And don't let anybody ever tell you differently. Absolutely, Vin. Now, <laughs> let's go from that to switching gears on a little thing I released yesterday. If you were a patron, you saw this last week. Like, this is old news, but <laughs> no, this is for everybody else. Measuring round trip latency on Linux, covering all the basics. Like, hey, man, what is round trip latency? It's got visual aids. That's how long it takes a signal to get into your audio interface, get processed by your computer, and come out of the audio interface. Why is that important? Well, if you're trying to do any type of um, real-time monitoring, post-FX, latency is critical. And this is like, hey, I'm trying to play my MIDI keyboard, MIDI instruments. Or in the case of what we're doing here, we have a full mix minus set up and everything's being routed digitally through Reaper because I'm taking advantage of the mixer. So we need really low latency to make sure our communication's good and also so we can do self-monitoring without because if you've ever been in that weird situation where the audio delays too much it can prevent you from talking that's a truth so what do i do here what do you need to get it installed pretty simple right out of the box you need a cable you need an audio interface and one thing i really wanted to point out that i thought was important was people don't because they'll say i know what my round trip latency is and they think it's this they think it's this, but I'm going to show you. Down here at the bottom, like in QJAC CTL, mm -hmm. it says latency 5.33. Yeah. People say, yeah, that's what my round-trip latency is. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. That's not your round-trip latency. That's a theoretical best-case scenario of what it could be if your computer didn't exist. That's a fanfic number. That is not what your round trip latency is. That is reported block latency. It has nothing to do with your actual real time latency, which is always easy to spot because people will give you that exact number, like 53321. Like you can math out what uh, sample rate, what period buffer they have set. So this will give you an actual number. How much latency can you deal with? A lot of people are kind of confused on this too. This is something I point out in the video. You can normally deal with about eight milliseconds up. And you can deal with 11 milliseconds, but you're going to hate it every single millisecond that you're dealing with 11 milliseconds <laughs> before things start getting squirrely. 
Now, that's not too far away, though, uh, because how far? How long does it take for your 8 milliseconds? How, how far away from a sound source is 8 milliseconds? Let's say, Jill, you, you got your big electric axe and <laughs> uh, you got an amplifier. How far away from that amplifier can you be before you hit 8 milliseconds, where it takes 8 milliseconds from that audio to get to your ear holes? Hmm. I'd say 10 feet? Close. Mm-hmm. Nine foot. Oh, okay. So it's even cool. less. 2.7 meters <laughs> yeah. is eight milliseconds. Now we're factoring in, you know, sound propagation through air. So of course, altitude and temperature come into effect, but nothing that is mm. really going to um, affect that calculation because sound's pretty constant. Sound's going to travel at 0.344 meters per. Uh, derp, derp. I'm fighting this YouTube video right now that I'm trying to get to a spot to play for you guys. And you know that bottom thing that keeps popping up? Oh, yeah, yeah. When you pause? <laughs> oh, I, oh, I wish I could turn that off. <laughs> yes, this, this is like what I'm fighting right now. This is what I'm fighting right now. I apologize for everybody. But most importantly, I was able to get my Hello Kitty reference in there. And that Aww. took a little bit of doing. Aww. But one of the things I also wanted to point out is this. this. Even if you don't care about audio latency, this is good practice. So you can shave about two and a half, three milliseconds latency off by plugging your audio USB audio interface into the right USB hole. Now, what's the difference? Well, like your front panel and some of your back panel, especially like, you know, the two designated like PC mouse USB ports on the back. Mm -hmm. Those are all typically going to go through your motherboards chipset. In my case, it's X399. But everybody, you know, everything, you know, B450, B550, whatever chipset you have on your motherboard, then it's going to go to your CPU. What you want to do is get your manual and find your USB ports that report directly to your processor. Mm, yeah. In this video, that shaved off on like three milliseconds. Just boom. Free time right there. So yeah, go check it out. It's step by step. And most importantly, we love benchmarks. So you can go, hmm, where is my audio fish on it? And we can play that game. Yeah, Head over my to inbox Lens, too guess. many is in there. Yeah, inbox it still holds up. It's a good piece Yay. of kit. Like surprisingly, the fastest, and then we're all like around eight milliseconds. I show you the settings, which is going to be you know 128 frames will buffer size to two, so you can test at home, and that'll give us like a good baseline. And I've been testing USB, FireWire, PCI Express, soon even PCI. Oh, uh, yeah, if that's important to you, or if you're just curious, you want to learn a little more about how audio works under Linux. There you go. Hope you like it. Now, what else do we have? Oh, right. <laughs> Blackberry pies. Yeah, this mm. is cool. <laughs> Man. So, what is this? Uh, we, how many times have we talked about um, man that kind of looks like a raspberry pie? Or, you know, it's like, oh, that's very um, reminiscent. Like, I, I can kind of see a raspberry pie. Well, let me tell you. This Looks like a Raspberry Pi that has been tossed on the freeway and run over. A couple of times. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> so there's all the parts. <laughs> oh, no. So if we scroll back up, look at it right there. This is uh, when it's got us. It, this is a goth Raspberry Pi. What it is? Yeah. It's edgy. <laughs> it is. It's packed with a Raspberry Zero, a BlackBerry inspired keypad that you can order. There's a parts list and a Raspberry Pi camera, nor no IR. It even has a spectrum inspired, uh, you know, a little specky rainbow yeah. case. And yeah, that looks like the, it's got a fan in it. I, I love reading. It's like, I don't know if I need to have a fan in this, but you know, I'm going to put one in anyway. 3D printed. Everything you need to make, you know, bit, bit, yes, it's like a really big um, Blackberry, but you know, it's either that or a diseased Game Boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this one's really nice, though. I we had covered some uh, other uh, Raspberry Pi, BlackBerry, you know, look lookalikes, and this is one of the nicest one. I I like that it, you know, looks like a Specky and a BlackBerry merging into one. In fact, I was calling it a Speckberry. <laughs> it looks like a Speckberry. <laughs> 
And I think it is actually really cool. What's unique, one of the unique things about this one is that the GPIOs are directly accessible from the top of the LCD screen. That's awesome. You can spill stuff right into connection. them. Yeah. yeah, and that's one of the reasons why it's bigger because you have the access to the GPIO pins, <laughs> which is really nice. So what would you do with this? I have no idea, but you don't make cool stuff like this because it's practical. You do it because it's neat. Aw, and Steve Husband, you're right. He said in chat, HP calculator look. It, it does kind of, you know, big chunky slab. <laughs> we always count on you, Steve, for those topical 40-year-old references. Love it. Yeah. So <laughs> all this is going to be in the show notes. Go check it out. We're right at 30 minutes. We did good this week. We got in. Yes. We got out, covered everything. And again, happy birthday. Yeah. Debbie. Happy birthday, Debbie. That's we wonderful. Love you. And get other mm -hmm. test some of your round trip latencies. Let me know in that video's comments. But until next week, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Yay! I gotta learn where many switches are. There we go. Aww. Three, two, Aww. one. Dubsy, thank you for the 11 month resub. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yay! And, and he's in chat also. <laughs> thank you to all our wonderful pr patrons, including our one of our advisors, our Theron, who is in chat right now. Our executive producers, Barbrandt, Scott, Mike G, Pebble, our Chicago level people, Super Dust Out, Empty, Blasphemia, <laughs> our Sea Monsters, Treggy, Vera Tenuta, Justin, Frostclaw, lots of Death Notes, Dirty Dean, Back, Dodger, lots of chair chairlings, including Mir PPC in chat. This is LWW number 388. Wow, Ben. <laughs> Good on you. You got that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, everyone. We'll see you next week. Isn't that right? Yes. This one doesn't even like make a good noise when I hit it anymore. It's too stable. Oh, Good on yeah. you, Elgato. Good hey, on that's you. It's been a long time since you hit your mic. <laughs> this is, a, I think, the first time I've really walloped this one. Yeah. On the new mic arm. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Love you all.